Hi, this is Katie Ekblad. Hi, this is Carson Phillips. Hi, this is Stephen Giannotti. And today we are recording our Digilectic for Rhetoric, and we are going to be discussing JFK's Rice Stadium Moon Speech, which was delivered on September 12, 1962. The context of this rhetorical work is at this point in time, the USSR and the USA are on the race to the moon. The space race at this point has already seen the Soviets go to the space, go to space, while JFK is desperately trying to get us to the moon as a show of national power against the communists. So basically, America was not super happy that the Soviets had made it to space before we did, and JFK is addressing that. So we're going to move into just breaking down the speech really quick um, and just discussing it through that. Um, so I don't know. Who wants to start? Steven? Go crazy. Uh. Um, so he starts out, um, I noticed very right away, um, a lot of ethos. He brings up and, like, thanks, um, everyone who's there at the speech, like, listening, like, the vice president, governor, congressman, um, and, like, the scientists and the people at the university. Yeah, he addresses um, people for, like, ever. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. Um, he also brings up, like, a lot of, like, uh, physical facts and stuff, um, about, like, uh, especially you see it throughout the whole speech, but like um very like, like a lot of the numbers and everything. Yeah. Um, I think it's like a show of power though as well. Like there's a certain level of um kind of like grandeur to bringing along not only your vice president but different governors, congressmen. Uh, apparently a plural amount of scientists to the point where he doesn't even distinguish them by name. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's, it reminds me of, like, military parades. Essentially, he was bringing the scientific and political community out to show America just who's behind this cause before he even goes into addressing this idea that he's giving a statement on an actual failure. Yeah, no, that's what I thought, too. It was kind of like a flex. He was yeah, like, like, everyone, like, like, look at us. Yeah. So amazing, we meet at a college noted for knowledge in a city noted for progress while talking about our journey out of the atmosphere. It's yeah. like... He also says it's state noted for strength. So oh, my gosh. I wonder why Texas has such a big head. Oh, um. my gosh. Well, okay, so then he goes into, like, just talking about, like, the scientific discovery of man and, like, just, like, the progress in general, and he compares it to the Apollo program itself um that also like fits into this kind of like flex mentality where he's like look at the scientific you know evolution of man look how it fits into Apollo Apollo is so much better than that because look at the things that we've learned yeah I love um, the way how he puts it like if this if all of human like technology and advancement was put into 50 years it would have taken 10 years for them to start recording it like um we barely know anything about the 40 the, the first 40 years um, like, it took five years to write and use a cartwheel. Christianity began less than two years ago. Right, yeah. Um, like, all these things uh, take so much time to, like, develop. And then he's just like, yeah, we'll be at the moon tonight. So, like, I, we're doing great. <laughs> I love how he says, condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history. Right. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, then also I think that fits perfectly into just the reality that this this – this work is in grand style. Like right. he's yeah. he's clearly trying to leave this this very sobering uh, starting point of right. hey everybody we're here this is the committee that's spending all of your tax dollars yeah. on a project that hasn't succeeded and then directly go into just your friendly reminder the United States of America <laughs> are leading the next industrial revolution as we leave this earth and he actually goes from that relatively quickly but there's still a pretty obvious crescendo where he's almost running away from wanting to talk in a more grounded sense yeah for about sure. yeah about the project as a whole and yeah i mean by no means is it plain like but it is at some point an address where he is giving information out so yeah. i would I, I think we all agree that it should be identified as grand style oh for sure i think he like style. builds it up too like before he like goes into like the yeah. more plain parts too and like, that's the point is he's like oh we're gonna inspire but oh here's also like the things that you need to know about like what we're doing and how it's going but he wants to like capture the audience first um i that's guess right. to delight that would be it right like he wants to like delight first but yeah i also like how he covers himself by he's like we've had our failures but so have others they just don't talk about it like, we, <laughs> yeah we're like cool he's like we're very about open it, about our failures but like other people haven't but they exist yeah and they're less public it reminded me of pericles funeral oration because he like brought that up the mm. same way you know he starts off by being like look at the great man who like gave his life and all this stuff 
stuff and he's like capturing and it's like this honor and this you know and then he goes in later and he's like oh join us here's like what you need to do and I mean literally yeah. you can swap out context and not just see the parallels but uh, just see that how tempting it is for political figures to do things like this where it's like oh for sure you have, you have Pericles where it's like we've lost a great battle we've lost a number of men you're all tired you're all confused on yeah. why this is even happening but I assure you if you look at the great scheme of humanity and our culture we need to do this JFK is losing morale nationwide because mm-hmm. the evil communists are gaining power, at least in image. Um, we're losing tax dollars by the minute. Right. Um, and if I remember the history correctly, he's in one of his presidential scandals at this moment. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> and it's like saucy, but... Um, <laughs> The oh my gosh. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe could not fly JFK to the moon. Dang it, Marilyn. Only the scientists could. But but in all seriousness, like <laughs> right, right. Right. this idea that um he's doing the exact same thing where it's he's taking he's taking an environment this is supposed to be an address, an update really. Yeah. He's speaking at a college and at the funeral oration you're speaking in honor of the dead, but immediately you crescendo it into this great encomium of praise of your culture. JFK does the exact same thing. Yeah, he what starts it, praising America and the fact that we are pure humanity and have the capability to go beyond. Yeah, something he says actually is like, this country was conquered by those who moved forward and so will space. He's like, we're going to conquer space because of like the way that we've moved in the past. Yeah. Like, yeah, we are like the epitome of man. Like, it's the greatest thing that's ever been, you know? Um yeah, I also like how he keeps it like, he's like, we're going to be peaceful. Like, it's for information and knowledge. I swear. <laughs> um, it's for information and knowledge. <laughs> um, but he's like, we're going to be the best. Right. Um, so he's like still keeping that um, theme of like, we're number one. Yeah, yeah. this isn't something we really, we've we really spoken about. But in the context of history, there's also just tons of double speak going on throughout oh, the work. Sure, where yeah. something in context means something completely different than if somebody in uh, the 60s heard this. Uh, we're talking about, like, just in the reality that 20 years later, you'd see the evolution of missile technology, mm-hmm. things like the race to space at this point in time, much like the funeral oration in, in historical context means something completely different. Right. Which I find, yeah. which I find incredibly yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, another piece that this reminded me of was Gorgias's Inconium of Helen, which, like, doesn't have as many parallels, but just in, like, the defense aspect of it, because Gorgias kind of defends Helen in the same way where he's like, oh, look at this, you know, look at, like, the place that Helen was at, like, look at the way she was persuaded by stuff. I know that, like, he's defending something not, like, rhetorical, he's defending a failure on, like, the government's part, so to speak, but, um, yeah, I don't know, he drags us into this whole, like, epitome of man thing of being like, oh, look what other people did, look how, like, they you know, conquered and... I mean, in a way, it's kind of the inverse, where it's like the encomium of Helen was almost like an apologetics for the failure of another, but it's like, or like the wrongdoings of others that led to a failure that didn't have to take place. seems like JFK is like an apologist for failures that haven't even happened yet. Yeah, He's apologizing for stigma and perception as opposed to justifying an action done. So I think it's it's a solid comparison. It's, It's basically the inverse of... Uh, when, what Gorgias is trying um, to do specifically says like we have to like make these failures we have to pay like these taxes and stuff we have to put this forward because like it's so important yeah he brings up like especially he's like I was the one who like it kind of places the blame on him um, a little bit but he's also like I was the one who decided like we should bring this um, from like a low like low effort into the space program to like right. high effort he was the one that pushed it forward yeah and everything. i think that like basically like what puts all these pieces similar like i compared it to augustine's confessions and homer's iliad as well like all of them are just like a, trying to make the subject appear to be so human but then to be above human and like that's like not augustine's confessions so to speak he like more so brings you down to humanity mm-hmm. but like iliad you know and conium of Helen, and then pericles as well it, like, is supposed to bring people into the perspective of being like, oh, my gosh, this man did this. I think what? I'll actually argue you on that oh point, my gosh. Katie. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I just really appreciate how, you know, Augustine's uh, appeal to the spiritive was still in an elevating sense. And I think you can identify JFK doing the same thing, which is <laughs> this kind of almost, like, double-layered of, no, there's still a very grounded plan. He just wants you to empathize with the position. Yeah. So as romantic as he is... You know, Augustine's still trying to elevate you to a point of truth. And I can see JFK doing the same thing just with an idea. Which, well, of course, the two aren't even really comparable. It's God versus space. That's but, what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Also, I think it's that's what I was trying to say is, like, Augustine's pointing to God and JFK's pointing to something so physical. Yeah. 
<laughs> just say it. Just say. It. I just, you know, I just really love arguing, much like JFK likes arguing with the with the Soviets. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Okay. Um, I'm gonna continue. No, some another connection to confessions that I noticed was um, kind of like um, because it's called the confessions. Augustine's like, oh God, I'm so sorry. Like, like forgive me for like mm-hmm. all the sins and like bad stuff I've done calling back again to, like, JFK being like, I'm sorry, like, we're kind of bad right now, but, like, we're improving. And, like, I we're feel like JFK it. totally doesn't do that. Sorry. <laughs> Finish what you were saying. No, I, th- I just think it's kind of like, instead of, like, asking God for forgiveness, he's, like, asking yeah. other people, like, forgive me, like, and then, like, I think if you change forgiveness me. to trust, uh, the parallels oh, are okay. more clear. Oh, okay. All right, I like, can see that. I would say, yeah. like, the through line is both are asking for some degree of empathy. Yeah. In, not sympathy, but empathy. So, like, Augustine yeah. wants yeah. you to get what his mentality was. JFK wants you to understand the gravity of the position we're in. And it both ends with this kind of underlying aspect of maybe not so much forgiveness, but trust that this is the path one ought to go on. In Augustine's sense, it's if you are like me, you should, this is a very rudimentary boiling down of confessions. But if one is like me or studying me, understand why I ought to behave like this and elevate myself to God through my confession, through the confessions, and then in JFK's fought to the moon speech, understand why we need to make this decision as a nation and as a race to trust in the American ideals of getting to the moon, because even though you might not realize it, this is what one ought to do. I think the difference really comes down to Augustine's writing in retrospect. Looking back, he's connecting a state he's in to a state he was. Yeah. JFK is looking toward the future. Right. We don't know we're going to the moon yet. Right. Yeah. So a moment that hit me with that was when he's, like, just trying to, like, he does try to just, like, humanize it, which I really appreciate, into, like, looking forward, into just being, like, so that every American can feel like like a, like a very important piece of, like, this trip to the moon. I think that mm-hmm. that's something that he tries to do is, like, to humanize it to that point. Um, And I had, like, quoted this, or I think Stephen had quoted this earlier, but when he said, like, we've had our failures, but so have others, even if they don't admit them, and they may be less public. He's like, this failure was super public. He's like, and we're admitting to it. Um, And then he immediately, like, pivots uh, into, like, this call for boldness right after that. He's like, we've hit these failures. We've, this has happened. But then he switches over into being like, but, and he says, then we, we must, must be bold. bold. Yes. <laughs> yeah, an endless decade, yeah. It's that crescendo that really, like, marks the grand style is that going into, like, this little, this sharp pivot that just goes, like, boom. And then everyone, yeah. you know, is, like, super excited and he about makes, it. makes, like, those massive claims where, like, you guys are still going to, like, the people on this campus will still be in school when we, like, go yeah. Space. Right, yeah. Like, it'll be in this decade. He's like, We're we can do, do it. it. Yeah. Well, I mean, a cool thing about this, too, is like, this is a, obviously a speech given, too. So, going back to the style, like, you see little mini crescendos happen, but time, you can still yeah. map out his general through line. But yeah, no, that point of, I always, I think it's fascinating that, like, when you're speaking live and it, with some degree of candor, you can see little points where he's trying to direct the mood of a crowd that we can't see. Yeah. Obviously, we're reading a transcript, but, yeah. you know, this takes place in front of people who he's actively gauging their reactions right. to things. He's actively guiding their spirits in these moments. And yeah. I'd say that's part of what makes it a great rhetorical work is the fact you can read that at different points he's guiding these people's spirits yeah. with his with his voice. You can yeah. feel it, too. I yeah. mean, and you can see it, like, yeah, when you read it, and just, like, with the word choices, and even with, like, what he chooses to bring up, what he chooses to not bring up, it, yeah, it just guides. It yeah. guides your emotion. It's supposed to, like, move you. Yeah, and it, it does follow, like, all three of the things of, like, the united soul, like we were talking about in class before. Right. Um, like, um, to teach by clear light and by, like, um, power, or, like, move by power. Or yeah, yeah, will. yeah. Yeah, um, right. Like, what's the third one? <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember off the top of my head. Sorry, Hasso. Um, but no, he does um, encapsulate like all the things and like appealing to the whole soul and like using all of them to unite yeah. everyone under this idea of like we're gonna make it to space. I think he mentions Venus specifically. Yeah, he He's says like, something about Venus. Venus. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. and I mean. Uh, this comes back down to to like if that's necessarily a good thing that he's doing that obviously we're biased as americans but in the context of different people's opinions on rhetoric that we <laughs> we've encountered i mean this is a very very classic example i don't know if you guys would necessarily agree of what a lot of the ancients would call sophistry 
he really doesn't have a foot to stand on here. He's <laughs> yeah. effectively stolen all these people's money. They don't even really know what he's doing, especially in retrospect. They really didn't know what he was doing. And nobody's ever even done this before. This yeah. goal is that of musing, this idea that one can go to the moon. We don't even know if it can happen. And he's actively guiding people in grand style by the end to literally stand up and applaud at this fever dream that's going to cost unprecedented amounts of money. See, yeah. that's so interesting. I don't know if I would, like, go that far, though. Because, like, I definitely really? see what you're saying and, like, can see that, like, he's basically supporting this, like, it doesn't exist or whatever. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the Apollo program was really doing, like, so many things. And it's, like, it is something that wasn't seen, but technically one could claim that of Socrates. One could claim that of, like, anyone mm. that it's, like, they were doing, like, they were making waves that no one could see. Sophistry wasn't doing that. It was just there. But also sophistry is very much, like, make the weaker the stronger. It was, Which I yeah. think is very prevalent in this. I wouldn't say, like, he's, There's like, at least elements. Completely... Oh, for yeah. sure. There's, There's definitely elements. elements. I, I think that Kennedy just had more to stand on than yeah. a sophist. Yeah. I don't think, like... A sophist was just, like, I'm good at talking. I would go so far as Carson. I would go so like... far to say he holds the weaker argument. Like, he oh, yeah. is definitely 100%. presenting... But truth, dang it. Yeah, yeah but... <laughs> <laughs> but man must go to the moon and Katie must go to work. So this show is ending. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hasso. Dr. Hasso, you. you're the bomb. Uh, all right. All great. right.